Well, hello there. And if this is your first time here, I am so, so glad you're joining me on this podcast today. And if you are a returning listener, welcome back. I'm Nurse Mo, and this is the Straight A Nursing Podcast, where I teach nursing concepts and share tips on how to thrive in the school and at the bedside. So today we're going to be talking about assessment. I've been doing a lot of kind of in-depth assessment episodes lately. I did one on cardiovascular assessment, or rather, I did a cardiac assessment. I did a vascular assessment. I've done neuro. I've done respiratory. And now I'm going to talk about something that I call the doorway assessment. And no, it has nothing to do with looking at the doors. Now, before we get into that, though, let's take a quick minute for a listener shout out. And this one goes out to Anne. And Anne says this, I started listening to the Straight A Nursing Podcast when I was enrolled in prerequisites. It was great to have a head start into the program after completing Crucial Concepts Bootcamp. I'm now in my third semester, and I love listening to a relevant podcast on the way to morning clinicals. It's always a calming feeling to hear Nurse Mo explain a topic and helps me feel more prepared. I just bought my second planner, and it is definitely a must for any nursing student. Thank you, Nurse Mo, for all your amazing resources. So thank you, Anne. I'm so glad that you listened to the podcast on your way to clinicals and that it helps you feel confident, a little bit more calm, and ready for whatever the day may bring. So Anne also mentioned Crucial Concepts Bootcamp and my planner for nursing students. I will put a link to both of those in the episode notes, or you can just go to my website and you can easily find information about them there. Okay, so let's talk about the doorway assessment, as I call it. When I think about the doorway assessment, it's not necessarily that you're only doing these assessments from the doorway, though you certainly can, it's more of a, of a mindset, a framework for how you go about your shift, go about the flow of the things you do, where you work assessment into every single patient interaction, okay? And when I worked in the ICU, we had big glass doors, so you could, you literally could stand at the doorway and assess a ton of things on your patient just from looking and observing. So that's why I call it the doorway assessment. You can also do this when you pop into the room to deliver a warm blanket or you're going in to answer a call light or you're going into the room to deliver a PRN medication. Basically, you're assessing your patient constantly, not just when you do your head to toe in the morning and your vital signs later in the day or your focused assessments later in the day. It's all the time. It's constantly happening. It's running in the background of everything else that you're doing throughout your shift. So I call it the doorway assessment. You might want to call it something else, but it's just that constant, continuous assessment of your patient. Think of it as the act of intentionally observing your patient with every interaction. It's essentially a way of thinking and approaching your practice that puts noticing front and center. After all, one of your main jobs as the nurse is to catch changes in patient condition. And you can't do that unless you notice the changes. And you can't notice the changes unless you're observing the patient. So I will say that these assessments are 100% not intended to replace your head to toe, which you are still doing right? Hopefully every start of your shift, you're doing a full head to toe on your patient. And it doesn't replace your focused assessments. This is, again, a way to work assessment into your into your routine. So that's just always there. And this way, it will help you clue in to changes in patient condition. If you notice something has changed or as you're looking at your patient, observing them, and something's not as expected, that's your signal to pop in there and do a more thorough assessment and then also possibly also notify the MD depending on what you find. So what are some things that you can include in your doorway assessment? So 
A key one is level of consciousness. Just observe the patient. Are they awake? Are they asleep? There's data in that, right? Are they rousable to voice? Say their name. Hey, Bob, I brought your blanket. If Bob doesn't budge or open his eyes or move, then I would go and assess further. I might touch him on the shoulder and say it again. Hey, Bob, I brought your warm blanket that you asked for to see if he rouses. If he doesn't, I'm going to get a little bit more persistent with trying to wake up Bob. Maybe he's hypercapnic and needs BiPAP, right? I'm not just going to ignore that because it's not what I expected to see. Does the patient seem restless or agitated, which... If they have been restless and agitated, great. Okay, they're still restless and agitated. Hopefully that gets better. But if this is new, that could be a sign of hypoxia. That could be a sign of onset acute delirium. It could be all kinds of things and requires further assessment. Any change in the patient's level of consciousness means that you got to go in and do a more thorough evaluation. So with that, we're also looking to see how oriented they are. Ask a question. Do they answer appropriately? Now, I know with your head to toe, you're saying, tell me your name, tell me your birthday, do you know where you are, do you know what day it is, etc. I'm not saying you're asking them to do that every time you go into the room, but ask a question. See if they answer appropriately. Hey, what are you watching on the TV? And if the TV is showing a football game and they say that they're watching Murder, She Wrote, well, clearly they're confused, right? So just see if they answer questions appropriately. Or do they even answer at all? Do they seem oriented to their situation? A patient who is asking you, what the heck are you doing here at the post office with me? is confused. And yes, patients can think they are all kinds of places that are not the hospital when they're suffering from acute delirium. Is the patient following commands? Like those kinds of things can help you determine what their orientation is and if things are going as planned in that department. Any change, again, requires further assessment. So while you're at it and you're listening to them speak, how is their speech? Is it slurred now and it wasn't earlier? Are they saying nonsensical words in their sentences? Are they having trouble finding the right words? These could be signs of really big problems like acute stroke or acute delirium and definitely require immediate intervention. Another great and easy doorway assessment thing to look at is Are they moving their body in the way that you expect them to move their body? Now, this does not replace your neuro assessment at all. But if you peek your head in the room and the patient's up walking around with no clear signs of any kind of deficit, then they're probably moving everything okay, right? So you're probably good to go there. If you peek your head in the room, the patient had been sitting in the chair when you left them 20 minutes ago, you're back now and they're slumped over to the side, well, I'm going to go investigate that. Did they just fall asleep in the chair or did they have a stroke and now they're slumped over to the side because they had a stroke? I'm going to investigate anything that's not what I expect it to be. If I go in and I'm asking the patient, can you lift your left arm so I can assess your blood pressure, get this blood pressure cuff on, and they don't lift their left arm, that's a problem, right? So are they moving their body in the way that you expect them to be, making purposeful movement? And then safety. Safety is a big one. I want you to always Always be thinking about patient safety and get into the habit of just doing a quick safety scan every time you're in the room. I like to kind of look around when I get in there and then I look around again before I go. So the types of things that you might be looking for are Is the bed in that low position like it's supposed to be? Now, in the ICU, we don't necessarily keep the beds in that low position. We keep the bed at a height more comfortable for the nurse because the patient requires so much intervention. And a lot of times they're sedated. They're not getting out of bed or they're too sick to get out of bed. But for the most part, on the floor, bed low, 
bed locked. Okay, that's universal for everywhere. And are the side rails up or down as appropriate? So this will depend on the patient's level of care in the critical care environment. Four side rails up was not considered a restraint. But on the floor, it is unless that is to keep the patient from falling out of bed. That's what the Joint Commission website said the last time I checked very recently. So make sure you understand what is considered a restraint in your facility or by the Joint Commission as far as it pertains to side rails and that they're appropriate for your patient. You also want to check for any trip hazards. So Check around the bed because the patient, you know, if you've got a walkie-talkie, as we call them, your patient's going to be getting up to go to the bathroom, go sit in the chair, go out in the hall, do their thing. Check for trip hazards, not just for the patient, but for yourself as well. So I would check the whole room, but mostly I'm really focusing on that pathway from bed to chair because that's a common place that they're going to be going and from bed to bathroom. Okay, so always looking for any kind of trip hazard, a sock that's on the floor that fell off somewhere, a piece of equipment that wasn't put away properly. Sometimes there's cords, even though there shouldn't be. You'd be surprised, though. Sometimes there may be a cord trailing off and posing a trip hazard in that way. I'm also looking for things like the fall risk. So one of the reasons patients fall is they can't get to their overbed table. So is that overbed table within reach? So they fall trying to, you know, reach their mystery novel that they left on their table or their water or their glasses or the urinal isn't within reach. So they fall trying to reach for that. So just kind of looking around and noticing those things. People will often come in to interact with the patient. Let's say the dietitian comes in to talk to them about something and they move the bedside table out of the way. And then a lot of times people forget to move it back. So just always keeping an eye on those types of things. You also want to make sure the call light is within reach. Always before you leave the room, make sure the call light is there. How many times do you go into a room and it has fallen on the floor next to the bed or in between the rail and the mattress and the patient's like, I don't know where that dang thing is. I'm losing it all the time. Well, here it is. There you go. Push the button if you need anything and I'll be back to check on you in about 45 minutes or whatever it is. So call light within reach, very, very important. You want the patient to call for help before they get up if they're not completely independent with their movement. And if the patient, you know, you peek in, you do your doorway assessment, and they're trying to climb out of bed, they got one leg over a side rail, they've (laughs) pulling on their oxygen tubing, their IV is about to come out, okay, that's a safety issue, right? You're obviously going to run in and address that immediately. Okay, another thing to be on the lookout for as you're interacting, as you're looking in on the patient, observing them in all ways and at all times, is the patient at risk for respiratory compromise. Are they having any kind of respiratory distress that you can note? So again, this is not going to replace your respiratory assessment, but it doesn't mean you have to get out your stethoscope every time you're in the room and count their breaths every time you're in the room, but you can get a lot of information about their respiratory status from observing them. Are they speaking in full sentences? Typically, this means the patient is probably doing okay. They don't have any tachypnea. They don't have any really slow breathing. If you walk into your patient's room and you they're, you know, asleep and you can't really see much chest rise and it seems like the breaths are really slow, they may be having a respiratory issue. Maybe they're over-sedated, something like that. A patient who's doing okay is not going to have accessory muscle use. They're not going to be sitting in that tripod position that a lot of times patients with asthma or COPD will sit in to try to get more breath. They won't be doing pursed lip breathing. They won't have any strider or any abnormal sounds. And I can tell you, you can hear some abnormal breath sounds from a few feet away when they're really, really bad. Sometimes you can hear wheezing when it's really pronounced without having to get out your stethoscope. So if you're not hearing those things, doesn't mean they don't have adventitious breath sounds because again, you would have to listen for some of those with your stethoscope. But some of them, again, like Strider, super obvious. 
If the patient's on a monitored unit, then their SpO2 is normal. You can just glance up there and see it. Look at them. They don't look like they're in any distress. They're chatting on the phone with their husband. Chances are, respiratory-wise, they're doing okay right now. But if your patient's pausing every three breaths to try to tell you that they would like some more ice chips, then they're having respiratory difficulty because they're having to pause so often to take a breath. If they're breathing really fast, you can notice that. If they're gasping, you notice that. Anytime you see signs of respiratory distress, respiratory difficulty, the patient's looking like they're working a little hard to breathe, I want you to go in and do a more thorough respiratory assessment. And then pain, though technically, you know, the patient's pain is going to be a much more cooperative assessment. And many times you ask them their pain level, they tell you their pain level. You can observe for signs of pain. So nonverbal indicators of pain, such as writhing in bed, grimacing, guarding, things like that, moaning, okay, crying out, whatever it might be. So just peeking in if they look pretty comfortable, if your patient's sitting up in the chair, watching Wheel of Fortune, having their lunch, chatting with their family member, they could still have some pain. But at that point, it's probably pretty tolerable based on their nonverbal pain signs. And if it's time to assess their pain, then of course, you would go in and say, Hi there, Bob. What's your pain level? You look pretty comfortable. Where are you on that zero to 10 scale, et cetera? But in between and intermittently, you can catch up or catch note of the patient having a response that is showing more pain. Or maybe you gave some fentanyl a little bit ago, and now you're coming back to see how they're doing, and they're no longer writhing around or restless, and they're calmly playing a game on their phone or whatever it is. So you can get some cues about pain by observing your patient. And then a couple more here. We have skin signs. So as you're looking at your patient, you're making note that they don't have anything like pallor or that paleness, duskiness, jaundice that's unexpected, though. I would say if a patient's going to have jaundice, you'd probably already kind of know that they have something going on to cause that. It's not like it comes on super, super quickly. Um, Cyanosis would be another one. You know, those obvious skin signs. Is the patient suddenly diaphoretic and they weren't before? Hello. I need to go check this out. This person could be having something like a cardiac event or even just severe, severe pain. And then modeling, which is a very, very poor skin sign. You definitely don't want to be seeing that. That's a sign that the patient is in shock. And then the last one on this doorway assessment list is urine output. If the patient has a Foley catheter, I like to put the Foley catheter on the side of the bed where I can see it from the doorway or from you know, just coming into the room without having to walk all the way around to the other side because I want to keep an eye on their urine output. If they've got a Foley catheter, there's a reason. And the reason is we need to keep an eye on their urine output. So I'm eyeballing it for quantity and for characteristics. Is it suddenly bloody? Is it suddenly cloudy? Is it really, really dark? These are things that are going to make me do further assessment. Now, a lot of times the patient will be using a urinal. So I'm keeping an eye on that as well. If it's sitting there on the bedside table or flung over the side rail of the bed and all that's in it is like 20 mils of really dark urine, am I going to let that go or am I going to assess further? We're going to assess further. So all of these things, you're doing all these kinds of assessments whenever you're interacting with your patient. And Maybe assessment is too heavy of a word, but it is. It is an assessment. It's like an observation of the patient. It's kind of an informal assessment. Definitely none of this takes place of your head to toe. None of this takes the place of checking all your vital signs. None of this takes the place of doing a neuro assessment if that is warranted, et cetera. So those things, again, were things like level of consciousness and the patient's orientation, if they're confused or if they're with the program, their speech, and if they're moving everything purposefully or in the way that you expect them to be moving. Safety, a really, really huge factor. 
respiratory issues. You want to catch respiratory issues before they get out of control because patients can deteriorate quickly. You can observe for nonverbal indicators of pain, check their skin signs, and keep an eyeball on their urine output. Now, there are probably other things that you might find useful to observe for, and I'd love to hear what they are, so shoot me an email. You can find a way to contact me on the Straight A Nursing website and share your experiences with working this type of continuous assessment, continuous observation into your flow, into the way that you you run your shift. Because what we're getting at here is we want nurses to notice when there's a change in condition. And if you didn't know, the whole reason they changed the NCLEX is basically because of that, because they found that the old NCLEX, or the one that's um, changing very, very soon, did not assess the nurse's ability to notice a change in condition. And noticing that something is going on with your patient, especially before it gets bad, is an absolutely vital component of patient safety and better outcomes. So you're always, always observing and noticing. I say all the time that your job as a nurse and as a nursing student isn't to bring meds and warm blankets and help people get comfortable. I mean, that's part of your job, but your responsibility overall is to see problems and then fix them and then anticipate problems the patient could have and avoid them. And that's the nurse's role in a nutshell. And then all those other things fall under that. So when you think about that, your job, your role in that way, it's kind of like when you go to work, when you go to clinical, you're a detective and a problem solver. That's your job. I solve problems constantly at work. So sometimes when I get home and my husband wants me to figure something out, I'm just like, I can't. I can't solve another problem today. I will look at that tomorrow because I'm problem solved out at that point. So I hope this overview of this way of working assessment into everything that you do helps you feel more confident in clinical, and feel like you know what's going on with your patients. So I want to see you back here next week where we're talking about ACLS, your certification for ACLS. If you're going into that for the very first time, it can be a little bit intimidating, and I want you to have a little bit of a preview and a sneak peek into what that is like. So I'll see you back here next week for that. Bye for now. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing.